Greetings to everyone! In today's video you will see a teardown of this Sherwood RD6504 5-channel AV receiver, which was about to go in the bin. But now it will serve a bit of a more meaningful purpose than just be recycled. Before I start, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to this channel, follow me on Instagram or even consider supporting future videos on Patreon. All the links are included in the description. So, this is Sherwood RD6504 AV receiver. I know that this receiver is very basic, I don't expect to see cutting-edge technology inside of it. However, I believe that it might be useful to know how cheap units like this are built to be able to compare and appreciate higher-end models. I will remove the top cover first, as usual. It is fixed with two screws from the right, another two from the rear, and last two from the left hand side. Top cover feels quite light and floppy. This receiver doesn't look very busy inside. There you go, you can see the main board, DSP and HDMI PCBs, transformer and standby power supply, amplifier and front PCBs. I will carry on and remove the power cord. And yes, this is a 120V model made for North American market. Unfortunately, I was unable to power it up and test it as this task would require a step-down transformer, which I don't have. Great! Next, I will untangle and unplug auxiliary and Bluetooth port cables so I can carry on and work on the front panel extraction. Next goes a power switch cable as well as a headphones board cable. Unrectified front PCB power supply cable can be unplugged next. And the last cable to be unplugged is this shielded ribbon cable which links main and front PCBs. I will protect its end with some electrical tape to prevent any damage that might be caused by static electricity. After three screws securing the front panel from the bottom, as well as two screws from each side are undone, the front panel can be separated from the main chassis. A front panel made entirely from plastic is just another proof that this is a very cheap receiver. Even nuts that are usually used to secure the knobs are not here. Now I'm going to remove the Bluetooth PCB. Even though it's called Bluetooth PCB, it doesn't have a Bluetooth receiver on board. You would have to buy a Bluetooth dongle separately if you wanted to play your music wirelessly. Terrible idea to be honest. Great, now I will unplug the shielded ribbon cable so it doesn't get in my way. Next goes the auxiliary input PCB. I have never seen 3.5mm jack auxiliary input on the front of the receiver before. Usually it's RCA connectors. Alright, headphones PCB is next as well as the on and off switch. Here we go, another 20 screws are undone and I am able to extract the front PCB. Nothing too special about this PCB. Input selector and volume knobs are here together with a over a dozen micro switches. 
IR receiver and of course a vacuum fluorescent display. This display is controlled by the chip made by Cilian Microelectronics. SC16315 is a fluorescent indicator panel controller slash driver. After removing all the plastic buttons, I am completely done with the front panel. I guess now I can carry on and extract the component video PCB. After unplugging the single cable which connects it with the main board and undoing four screws, this board can be successfully extracted. This board is a technically standalone two input, one output component video switcher. There are no links between this board and composite or HDMI inputs. Switching between inputs is implemented by this wide band free input, one output, free circuit video amplifier made by JRC. My next logical step would be to remove the HDMI board. It is held by only three screws and a connector which links it with DSP PCB. This connector is quite tight, so I have to use my prying tool to separate these boards without causing any damage. You can see two chips made by silicone image on this board. First one is SIL9233ACTU, which is 4-port HDMI receiver with repeater, multi-channel audio and deep color. Its main functions in this receiver are to switch between HDMI sources and extract the audio stream. Second silicone image chip is a HDMI transmitter. By the way, this receiver's HDMI version is 1.3, which is able to support Dolby True HD and DTS HD Master Audio. But in this case it's irrelevant, because the receiver itself does not support these formats. And the last chip is Runessa's single chip microcomputer. Amazing, now it's time to remove the transformer. In order for me to proceed, I have to unplug three remaining connectors. First one fits audio video I.O. section along with DSP and HDMI boards. Next is the main transformer fit which is controlled by standby PCB. Last one is the fit for amplifier section. To unscrew the transformer I have to grab a bigger screwdriver as the screws which are securing it are quite chunky. This transformer has one primary winding and four secondary windings. Here's whole power section schematic diagram. Take a look if you are interested. Finally it is time to remove the rear panel. 23 screws are out and panel is extracted. The good news is that I am getting closer to the amplifier board. As amplifier board is attached to the heatsink, I will extract them in one go. Before I do that, I must disconnect an audio input cable. I'd like you to notice that this cable is not even shielded. Next goes an amplifier output and the power feed connector. Three screws holding heatsink from the bottom are undone, along with four screws holding it from both sides. Finally, the heatsink is almost effortlessly separated from the main chassis. It looks like all transistors were soldered after the amplifier board had been attached to the heatsink. So in order to separate these parts I have to desolder them all. Glad that I have my fancy TS80 soldering iron. Alright, all five screws are out and we can have a closer look at the amplifier PCB. 
my first impression when I saw this board was is that it? <laughs> Where are the rest of the parts? As a comparison have a look at Marantz SR7500 and MM8077 amplifier boards. These boards are more densely studded with parts. Of course it's a less powerful and way cheaper unit, but it was interesting to see different amplifier boards side by side. Sherwood claims that it's a 5 channel 500 watts receiver. But if you would study the user manual a bit more carefully, you would find that it can produce 110 watts per channel only when two channels are driven. On top of that, take a look at total harmonic distortion, which is 0.7%. In comparison, Marantz MM8077 and SR7500 total harmonic distortion is 0.08%, which is nearly 10 times lower. Let's not forget about transistors, which are this KTB2510 and KTB1510. The design of this amplifier section is a bit weird, I must say. If you would ever need to replace one of the transistors, you would have to desolder all of them. Bending back PCB with transistors still attached would potentially break one of the tracks. I have downloaded the datasheet of these transistors and found a couple of curious facts. First thing you see when you open the datasheet is Not recommended for new design. Doesn't sound like a promise of good quality. Also, the datasheet states that these transistors are recommended for 60 watts audio amplifier output stage. Not exactly 110 watts as Sherwood claims. Great! After a quick look at the heatsink, I can continue the teardown and extract the standby PCB. As all the cables has been disconnected before, I only have to pop this very weird connector between this and main PCB. Two screws are undone and the board is out. The main task of this board is to keep the NEC microcomputer, which is located on the main PCB, always powered, so the receiver could be switched on using the remote control. One little step before I start removing the main board. I have to disconnect this tiny ground bus cable linking the DSP board and the chassis. Seven screws are undone and main PCB is extracted. I will put it aside while I'm still dealing with the chassis. Four feet are removed and I'm completely done with it. To prevent any possible damage while I'm trying to separate DSP board from the main PCB, I will use my handy prying tools again. Alright, let's have a look at the DSP board. The largest chip in the middle of the board is a digital sound processor made by Texas Instruments. Unfortunately, I was unable to find datasheet, so I couldn't give you more details. There are two chips on the right-hand side of DSP. One of them is flash memory made by Macronix International and the other one is Apex random access memory chip. This tiny fellow here is a linear regulator made by Texas Instruments. It compares the output voltage with a precise reference voltage and adjusts the pass device to maintain a constant output voltage. After the input signal from coaxial inputs passes through the linear regulator, it gets into the AKM4588 chip. 
which is 2-channel analog to digital converter and 8-channel digital to analog converter enclosed in one housing. Great, now that I'm done with the DSP board, let's have a look at the main board. It's a hybrid board, which has a linear power supply section with speaker output terminals nearby, tuner pack, video audio I.O. and volume control section, and main single chip microcomputer located on the flip side of the board. This NEC chip implements control functions of the whole unit. Switching between composite video sources is done by this Sanyo 4 input 1 output monolithic video switch. As I have suspected, different format video inputs are not linked between each other in this receiver, so you have to stick with a single video format to take advantage of the video switching functions of this receiver. This is Renesas Audio Sound Controller, the chip which switches audio between different sources and controls output volume level. These were more or less interesting facts about the main board. Before I wrap it up, let's have a look at all the chassis parts and screws. I think the top cover deserves a bit more attention, as this is the floppiest top cover I have ever came across with. And of course have a look at all the electronic components of Sherwood RD6504. Sherwood RD6504 is a very cheap receiver with limited functionality and without big ambitions. It's a bit disappointing that I haven't got a chance to hear it and evaluate its performance, but something tells me that I would not be too impressed. However, it was very interesting to see it from inside. So this is it for today's episode. Give this video a thumbs up if you have enjoyed watching it or found it useful. Thanks for spending your time on Bortech channel and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.